So, you know, when you decide you're going to go for a jog or a run and you're going and you're going, but like the breathing is hard and you can't wait to be done. That's a little bit like what we're going to be talking today. Just that bit of stress with a little less oxygen that makes your heart pump faster. It makes your body work a little harder to rebuild and get stronger. That's the whole principle behind acute intermittent hypoxia. The idea of using a little less oxygen intermittently to help switch on recovery mode. Today, I'll be asking Dr. Valerie Verge to help walk us through it. She's our researcher under the scope. host Jen Cannell, and today I am visiting the director of the Chemico MS Neuroscience Research Centre. She is a neuroscientist. She's a professor of anatomy, physiology, and pharmacology. That's all part of the University of Saskatchewan's College of Medicine. She's also the past president of the Canadian Association for Neuroscience, and this woman has received so many accolades over more than four decades. Because there's this list, right? They compile it at Stanford University this list of the world's best scientists, the global top 2% most cited scientists. Well, Stanford University says Dr. Valerie Verge has earned her place on that list. After 43 years of studying how to repair our nervous system, today she's going to walk us through acute intermittent hypoxia, a potential treatment for multiple sclerosis and other neurological challenges. Dr. Valerie Verge, welcome to Researchers Under the Scope, and thanks for letting us record this at your house. Well, thank you so much, Jen. It's wonderful to have this opportunity to talk about what we're up to at the uh, Chemical Neuroscience Research Center. Well, and I know that when you were just starting out, you started in Montreal, and initially you never thought you'd be able to pursue a career as a biomedical researcher. If you can take me back there, what was the situation? Why did you think you weren't going to be able to do this? (laughs) I'm a Montrealer, and so, of course, whenever I finished my BSc, I was looking for a job, and I happened to land one in one of the top research labs that studies regeneration of nerves after injury. And even though I was in love with the research, I unfortunately developed a really severe allergy to the rodents. I thought that I was going to have to choose another career. It was that bad? mm -hmm, It was that bad. I was using a box of Kleenex a day. Oh. (laughs) But I just decided, okay, if this is not to be my course, even though I love it dearly, I'm going to have to retrain in something that could bring me some money and and be a viable career alternative. (laughs) New career choice, okay. So I love math, and I decided to do another degree at night while working in the lab in computer programming at McGill. And so I did that, finished that, but at the same time, my allergies became a bit better. And so I was going, oh, maybe I can pursue this career. And so the computer programming degree came in really handy because at that time, we could not do what we routinely take for granted now, take images from a microscope and put them into a computer and then analyze those images using computer-assisted image analysis. And so what we did back then is a group of people, we just sat down and we figured out ways to write extremely dense code because back then computers had like 20 megabytes of memory in your lab. And I'm just thinking about even the computer languages that were in use at that point, like basic, like that's... It was mostly C and assembler, yeah. And yeah, it had to be written very concisely. Oh, And so we, we did that, and we had some of the first image analysis system out there in the 1980s, you know? Yeah, it came in very, very handy because we were able to very quantitatively analyze all of our images. From there, where did your research career take you once you realized, yeah. okay, I can medicate this a certain amount yeah. when I'm dealing with the rodents? So, yeah, I'd been working six years as a technician and finally realized I could take the rodents So we were able to do the neurosurgery that we needed to on these things without me suffering. And then, well, I didn't do an MSc. I skipped into the PhD because I'd already been doing research for so long there. And when I finished my PhD, I had secured a very highly sought-after postdoctoral position at the Karolinska 
Institute in Stockholm, Sweden. Oh, you would have been so happy. <laughs> yes. And so um, before setting off there, I was actually offered a tenure track position at McGill as an assistant professor. I had trained under the chief of neurosurgery. It was the chief of surgery at the Montreal General Hospital in McGill, Dr. Dave Mulder, who offered me the position. And I was jokingly told not to fall in love with a Swede. Why? <laughs> well, this is because my mom had just passed before I set off for my postdoctoral studies, and I had waited until that happened. And so I deliberately set up a collaboration to come back and make sure that Dad was okay. And so um, this collaboration that I came back for in March of 1991, yeah, I sat on an airplane and beside this guy, and we started talking. And before I knew it, I found out he was from Saskatchewan. But I didn't know what he did, and he found out what I did, and he started really questioning me with question after question about right brain, left brain theory, this and that. And I was going, oh, this person's very well read and has a good grasp on the science. But then he started asking me about specific molecules and ways that I actually did the research. And so one of these substances that I was using in my research at that time, which was on the basal forebrain cholinergic system. That's a system involved in cognition and memory. Okay. And so one of the substances was an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. Well, it's when he began to ask me very pointed questions on this that I looked at him and I said, what do you do? And he says, oh, I farm. And I looked even more perplexed. And I said, well, how do you know so much about cholinesterase inhibitors? And he says, oh, that's grasshopper spray in my world. <laughs> And he's just like that. He's um, he's an extreme intellect. He comes from a family of intellects. And anything he does or works with, he has to know everything about. And so, you know, that. So I was going, ooh, you know. A Saskatchewan farmer, but with some very good questions. Oh, my goodness. And so I had to write back about a year later to Dr. Dave Mulder and say, I'm sorry, it's worse than what you can imagine. His name is Ole Olsen. He was over visiting relatives in Sweden and Norway. Sat beside him on an airplane, and now I've got, I think I have to find a position in Saskatchewan. Oh, my goodness. And at that point, he said, there's something about me you don't know. He goes, I'm a farm boy from Saskatchewan. Wasn't he trained right here at the University of Saskatchewan? I passed by his picture in the College of Medicine, graduated, I think, in 1964. One of the world's top trauma surgeons, surgeon to the Montreal Canadiens, the Habs. And so his farm is like only about 40 kilometers from where we are where oh. we farm. And so it's such a small world. I have stopped trying to predict it. <laughs> it is all good. Everything has turned out beautifully. But um, when I came to Saskatchewan, yeah, we had some wonderful opportunities. And one of them was the vision of Dr. Walter Hader. Yeah. Now, can you tell our listeners who aren't familiar with Dr. Hader just a little bit about him and what he did in Saskatchewan just before you got here? Oh, my goodness. Dr. Walter Hader set up the very first MS clinic. He saw the need. He knew that they were capable of doing it. He and his wife, Mary Hader, who is also a, who is an RN, they would travel the province and, you know, see patients and see patients here in, in Saskatoon at the Saskatoon City Hospital. He really wanted to create a research center that was in close proximity to the clinic so that it would really foster increased clinical research, increased intensivity in MS-related research at the University of Saskatchewan and allow for a clear path of communication between scientists and clinician. And this is really critical, and this has really worked out to our advantage. Over the years, we have grown tremendously. Our focus on MS research is larger than ever. And so we have about 18 principal investigators Four of us have our actual labs in City Hospital in the Chemical MS Neuroscience Research Center, the others in at the University Across of the river, yep. Uh -huh. But we can all get together, collaborate. They all have access to the center if they need to use any of the facilities there. Um, but most importantly, what it does is it provides an avenue for collaboration and interaction. And that is happening at a greater and greater rate. Our Clinical capacity has really grown. And when you came to Saskatchewan, how far along was Dr. Hader with the clinic? He was, oh yes, the clinic was well established. He was doing a lot of genetics work. He was, you know, able to get 
critical blood samples from the patients. Here we have a province, and this is very nice for doing research on the genetic side, a province that does not move around too much. And so most of the patients stay here. And so with that, he had access to a relatively stable population that he could look at over the course of decades. And so this really gave some very valuable insights. Well, and I know that the thing I wanted to ask you about mm -hmm. today was what I think of as oxygen deprivation, oh. acute intermittent hypoxia. <laughs> and where did the idea to reduce a patient's oxygen come from? Well, you know, all of this stems back to how can we get nerve cells to fire? Over the years, what we have realized is that we can greatly elevate the ability of a person's nervous system to repair itself if we impose a certain level of stress, like for instance, making nerve cells fire. We all know how beneficial exercise is. So you think about exercise, it does impose a beneficial level of adaptive stress that we say, you know, that we adapt to. When we run, we run out of oxygen, we have lower oxygen level in our muscles, and our heart is trying to keep up with everything. There's minute bits of damage that are done to the heart every time you really run. And with that, you turn on these very beneficial adaptive responses, not the extreme ones, like whenever you have a stroke and you're completely deprived of oxygen, but what you turn on is, a, is an ability to adapt and turn on repair programs. And so this whole concept of making nerve cells fire, make the, that in turn makes the nervous system repair better, we first started looking at ways to do this with direct nerve stimulation. And that was a proof of principle. And that one you can apply to peripheral nerves when you're repairing them, like, you know, whenever you release the um, median nerve for carpal tunnel surgery. And so you can do that clinically. But whenever you think about MS, and, and we even showed it in MS models in, in our in our preclinical rodent models, that this could really turn on the repair response. But in MS, in a model, you can actually specifically demyelinate or remove the myelin from a region of the spinal cord or brain that you want to, and then directly stimulate the nerve that would go into there and look at the repair, and it repairs way better. Hmm. But MS attacks can happen anywhere in the spinal cord and brain. And so because of this, I was looking for a non-invasive way to do this. You're not going to start sticking electrodes everywhere in, in a person's brain and spinal cord. And so it happened at the same time that one of my collaborators, Dr. Jillian Muir, who is now the Dean of the Western College of Veterinary Medicine, but she and I had been collaborating for quite a while. And she had gone down to do a sabbatical in Florida with uh, Dr. Gordon Mitchell. And he was a world expert in using acute intermittent hypoxia, which is where you breathe normal levels of air, and then you reduce it down to about half the level. So normal levels of air are 21%, and then you go down to 11%, and you cycle this. You go up and down like this, and you absolutely have to cycle it. Ah. You can't just expose the person to the you know cumulative amount of time that they were at that lower level of 11%. It doesn't work if you just sit there in sort of a steady state yeah, of low oxygen. Exactly. But if you alternate it with the regular, then it makes the nerve cells start firing. He was very interested in spinal cord injured patients and spinal cord injury, where they lose the capacity at a very high cervical level to breathe well on their own. Mm. And so his big focus was on, you know, the nerves that control breathing. And he showed very nicely that after longer term spinal cord injuries, if he gave this therapy, it really improved their breathing capacity. And then that led to investigations with Dr. Muir to see if they could also improve functional outcomes. And so she is a behavioral expert in the spinal cord injury world. And she was able to very closely do very precise spinal cord injuries and then very closely monitor whether that improved grasping ability. It did. Oh. And so with that, when she came back and I started hearing about the molecule, you know, I said, hmm, this looks to me like it's not just neuroplasticity, which they thought it was solely. And, and just it, it, for anybody who doesn't understand. Yeah, that's just it. Neuroplasticity is where the circuitry that's not damaged becomes stronger. Because in spinal cord injured patients, these patients were able, if they had some spared circuitry at that high cervical level, they could locomote better after these treatments. They could maybe grasp things a bit better, which is huge because yeah. uh, that means control maybe, you know, in the, of their wheelchair. 
And so they were able to see improvements there. And so, but whenever I saw it, I thought, whoa, I started asking her if I could look at whatever tissue she was not interested in in her, in her animal models of spinal cord injury. And when I analyzed them, I saw repair genes being turned on in this tissue that was not damaged or anything. And so I was going, oh, there's a potential for repair as well, maybe. And so we started directly comparing electrical nerve stimulation, which we had done previously on on peripheral nerves where we completely severed them and reattached them, what we call coaptation, bring them back together neurosurgically, and then you stimulate the nerve for one hour. You get almost perfect repair with that type of response. It's a really robust response. And we directly compared that to giving two treatments of AIH. So this is 10 cycles, five minutes of normal air with five minutes of 11%. And what we saw was that the repair with the electrical stimulation was just as good as the AIH, but AIH is non-invasive. And one of the aspects of peripheral nerve injury that was really repaired beautifully was what one of the last phases of where we have to put myelin back on the axons, which is a a protective insulative type substance that does a lot of things for the, um, the electrochemical signals that we have to propagate from the nerve cell body all the way down the cable called the axon. I've always thought of the myelin as being sort of like the insulation that helps stop the cable from shorting. It, It, it's exactly like that. That's its principal function. And so one of the last steps is that, and the AIH did it as well as EES. They both did it way better than not having any treatment. And so then I said, ooh, myelination, okay, now it's time to test it. Yeah. In an MS model of, uh, you know, one of our most models of MS. Just about the same time, a student came on board, Natalia Tokarska, who actually was first author on the paper that you will link to at the end of this podcast. And what she did is she, number one, with the help of the the Levin lab, established the model in our lab. And then she actually looked at whether or not AIH treatment, acute intermittent hypoxia treatment, could improve the repair capacity of these mice after they had had a demyelinating attack, much like an MS attack. So this is a mouse model that is only supposed to get worse. It's only supposed to, you know, progress. So it's, it's, it will help give insight as to whether or not therapy might be useful in progressive forms of MS, which we currently have no real treatments for. We have a lot for early on in disease that actually impinge on the immune responses and keep those at bay. And so very few people actually have relapses anymore if they're on these therapeutics. But the big problem is, is that it about 10 years into the disease, it transitions into another phase called the secondary progressive phase. And this is far more challenging. There's something wrong with the ability of these older immune cells and older myelinating cells called oligodendrocytes to to actually function at the same level as they did whenever the person was much younger and, and in the other phase of the disease. And what does that look like in a patient? Like what does their life turn into? Well, in a patient, this can result in in permanent disability because you get a lot of what's called neurodegeneration. Mm. Once that happens, then you're looking at a more permanent disability state. Not to say that we're not trying to resolve that, okay? But what Natalia did is she took these mice and she induced the MS-like disease in them. And then she waited until these mice were at near peak of disease because no one's going to come in saying, I think I'm going to have an attack in the, you know, next month and please, you know, do something for me. No, they come into you right in the middle of an attack when the inflammation is high, when there's been a lot of myelin loss. And so she waited until the mice were at that stage, gave them seven days of treatment of AIH and then follow them for an additional week, and then an additional week yet. So up to two weeks after the last treatment. And what she saw and what is published recently in our GLIA paper is an extremely robust repair response like I've never seen in my 43 years of doing research. 
you know, one week after the last treatment, she saw an 80% reduction in the amount of inflammation. And eight zero? Eight zero. Eighty percent reduction in the inflammation in these mice. And so these areas or zones of inflammation are the only zones that we can quantify what's really going on in. So you can imagine we're left with, you know, a lot harder areas to find in the ones that received the AIH versus the ones that were just exposed to normal oxygen. Okay. I mean, that's a good problem to have, but. (laughs) Yeah, it is a good problem to have. And whenever you look more closely at it, we could see that these regions were in a much more advanced state of remyelination. Now you have to remember, this is the 20% that remains. So the other 80%, we can't tell, you know, we don't know for sure whether all of the myelination aspects were complete by that time point because that's awfully quick okay yeah and so but everything that we looked at so you you look for the reduction of the inflammation you look for improved markers of remyelination which we saw we used many three different ways of looking at this and we saw all three showing improved remyelination and then she also looked at what the state of the axon was in she could see that these axons now were back in a protected state. Oh. And so they had the properties of a, an axon that would not be prone to being cleaved by these enzymes that normally nick and sort of create breaks in the axon. And she also saw that the immune cells, our immune cells are our friends and our enemies. They can exist on a spectrum of pro-inflammatory to pro-repair. And what we're looking for is to see if we're shifting them towards the pro-repair with this treatment. And sure enough, she was. And so, yes, we were extremely delighted to see that basically every indice of repair that she examined had been improved by the treatment. Um, The other thing, too, is that we deliberately did it without combining it with exercise. A lot of treatments these days, they've combined it with exercise and shown even better effects. And so this is something to look at in the future, but not every patient is able to exercise. And so it was really important for us to see whether or not it would still have a beneficial effect. And it did. Mm -hmm. It sure did. She's now nearing completion of her PhD, and she has gone way beyond these initial studies to confirm whether or not it's effective in males. Because all of her first group, her first group of mice were all female because Unfortunately, MS is far more prevalent in females. There's about a three to one or four to one ratio of females to males that come down with MS. Stands to reason you'd look at the female rodents first. Yeah. So we looked there, but then of course, you know, males, males also get MS and they quite often get a far more aggressive form of it. And so it was really important for us to also investigate whether or not this is happening equally in males. And? Well, very preliminarily, and we can't say, but it looks like um, it's similarly beneficial, but she has to finish these studies. She's also looking at mechanisms of why and how this might be working, where we can actually look at all the genes and molecules that we are changing in response to this treatment and try to figure out why it is so beneficial. Um, But it's extremely hopeful. We're one of the, if not the lab, that's looking at it from a repair perspective in the world, um, there's a lot of brilliant work going on in trials being tried in spinal cord injury and, and ALS and some other disorders. But we have still to actually look at the full potential of AIH in a lot of injury states or places where you know you've had changes to the circuitry that might be able to be corrected by, by AIH treatment. I just think of it as a way of putting your body into repair mode. It is. That's why people who exercise regularly actually do better after they've had injuries, to, you know, or strokes or whatever. It's because their system is already primed. Well, you make me want to go for a run a little bit more now. <laughs> Maybe I do want to hit the gym. Valerie, thank you so much for joining us here on the podcast. Well, it's been an absolute delight. Like I said, it's um, it's a pleasure to see things come full circle. This is research that we started 40-some years ago. We knew that if we injured the nervous system and then re-injured it a week later, that that first injury really primed it. And so that has stayed in the back of my mind all the way through. And that was with Dr. Peter Richardson, with whom I did my PhD, his brilliance. And I was so fortunate to be mentored by so many brilliant people. And 
that is what leads to, you know, being able to give even more insight to the next generation of scientists that we're so fortunate to train. And there are some good ones, you know. A lot of good ones. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Dr. Valerie Verge is a professor of anatomy, physiology, and pharmacology at the University of Saskatchewan's College of Medicine. She's a neuroscientist, and she's the director of the Chemical Multiple Sclerosis Neuroscience Research Centre at City Hospital in Saskatoon. And if you click on our episode notes, you'll see a link to her team's work. You'll see a link to their most recent article on acute intermittent hypoxia, AIH. It was published this spring in the journal Glia. Researchers Under the Scope is a presentation of the Office of the Vice Dean of Research at the University of Saskatchewan's College of Medicine. We recorded and produced today's podcast on Treaty 6 territory, and we pay our respects to the First Nations and to the Métis ancestors of this place, and we reaffirm our relationship with one another. We'd sure also like to thank you for tuning in and for sharing your ears with us. I'm your host, Jen Cannell, and Researchers Under the Scope comes out every couple of weeks, so go and click those three little dots up in the corner, hit follow so you can subscribe and stay up to date. <laughs>